All right, I'm sorry, we don't have time for questions for Dr. Younger. I'd like to um, introduce Dr. Michael Van Elzeker. He is a postdoctoral research fellow at Mass General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and he's in the Neurotherapeutics Division. He's also an adjunct instructor at Tufts University. He does his research at the Martino Center for Biomedical Imaging, where he started an ME-CFS research program from scratch. Pretty good for a postdoc. Welcome, Dr. Van Elziger. Hi, everybody. Oh, I see. Um, so um, thanks very much for introducing me and for inviting me here. I'm really glad to be able to talk about this. There'll be some uh, overlap with Jared's stuff, which I think is good news, actually. We're sort of surrounding um, some important targets, I think. Um, and l luckily for him, I'm not going to talk about spectroscopy, although we are doing spectroscopy in both of the studies that we are currently uh, doing. So we're going to replicate that as well, which other groups are replicating. Um, so I'm going to focus a little bit on methods, um, and hopefully in a way that's not too wonky and will actually elucidate some mechanisms that I think are important, some of which Jared talked about and some of which I'll just add some cartoons to the things that he said, I hope. Um, so I'm at the Martino Center uh, for Biomedical Imaging. Um, I don't have any conflicts. So we just put this paper out. Jared was nice enough to cite one of our papers, uh, excuse me, one of our tables uh, that went through the um, spectroscopy da uh, data. And I just wanted to say that Sydney uh, my RA is about to apply for MD-PhD programs, and Paulita is going to apply for MD-PhD programs in a year. So keep your eye out if your institution is looking. Um, they're really great. Um, so we have two ongoing neuroimaging studies. One is a PET study of resting state microglia, which is similar to what Jared talked about. That's that Nakatomi 2014 paper, which I think is the, is the right way to go. And we're also going to be doing some sort of improved methods that I'll talk in a moment about. Um, and then we're also doing an fMRI study separately, but hopefully with overlapping patient populations, um, of post-exertion symptom provocation where we scan at baseline symptoms and then they undergo David Systrom's invasive exercise test that he talked about yesterday. Uh, and we know that that's going to make them feel sick for a little while. And so we bring them back the next day, take advantage of that so that we can actually get a good um, collection of what their brain is doing during that state. Um, so let me talk a little bit about this. So this is, um, in 1956, myalgic encephalomyelitis, the term was first printed in The Lancet. Um, and it was an article called A New Clinical Entity. And it was sort of a question. And th the question of it was, all these previous outbreaks um, through the 40s and 50s, the idea that maybe they were related, maybe they had some sort of similar uh, underlying um, problem, or maybe it was actually the exact same condition. Um, and the term benign myalgic encephalomyelitis was coined. I actually wrote about this slightly inaccurately in our review. I said that this was an Icelandic doctor. The Icelandic doctor responded to this in a letter. Um, and so that, I had that a little bit wrong in the paper. But um, then there was this sort of outbreak um, in Nevada in the mid-'80s. And I also had this a little bit wrong in the paper, where I said that uh, perhaps a connection wasn't made. My understanding is that there was a Freedom of Information Act request that showed that the term myalgic encephalomyelitis was discussed, but then it was decided to call it chronic fatigue syndrome, which I didn't actually know. Um, and so I, I think that's, that history is really interesting, because I'd sort of like to know what happened here. And there's a lot of different theories. People have ideas. Um, so I think it could actually help us if we sort of got to the bottom of this a little bit. Um, so the term myalgic encephalomyelitis, of course, means um, muscle pain related to central nervous system inflammation. And that term came from um, those outbreaks back in the 40s and 50s where they found some, they looked, what they described as sort of damage in the spinal cord and they described excess proteins in the cerebral spinal fluid. Um, but the fact is that uh, we need to get sort of modern techniques that, that look for that. And so that's what we're, we're going to do. Um, neuroinflammation is a little bit of an imprecise term. Jared sort of uh, alluded to this. Inflammation classically is sort of the invasion of immune cells into tissue. Um, and that's a cool study that, that he's planning to sort of see if that's happening. And microglia activation really is 
um, the, the proxy that we use generally in brain imaging as something that sort of you would expect it to happen if there were neuroinflammation, if there were actual cell penetration, although it's not really a, it's not really a tautology. Um, the, and this is the Nakatomi 2014 paper. And again, to point out um, this, this figure is really important, I think. The, the brain stem is where when you overlap this relatively small number of patients, the brain stem is what looked active in all patients. So remember when you see these splotches in brain imaging, uh, it's not biology, it's statistics. And so what you're seeing is signal here that lined up across all subjects. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why um, we may be missing signal even here. And uh, I agree with what Jared said about the, the idea of the split between patients here being really important. And that's something that uh, I think a, a critical reader of this paper could make counter arguments. I don't necessarily buy them. So we're going to do some methods to try to undermine those counter arguments and, and see if we can really um, demonstrate that this is a, a real thing. Um, so just a little bit of uh, information about the brainstem, why I think it's important, why I think it's something that we should be focused on, and why it's a little bit annoying to try and study. Um, so um, the brainstem is really central to a lot of things that we see problematic in this condition. So it's central to pain processing, periaqueductal peri gray, um, up here is sort of a, a key center for pain processing. Um, it's key for neuroinflammation. It's really where a lot of the communication between those two sort of artificially separated uh, body systems happens via the brainstem. Um, and it's also key for autonomic um, processing, which of course that's POTS. We see that over and over again where these are sort of some really central problems perhaps. Um, and if, to my mind, some of this is really important. This is the nucleus of the solitary tract where the afferent vagus, the one coming from body to brain, enters the brain stem. And then you've got dorsal motor vagus, uh, which is really important for autonomic and parasympathetic control. That also seems to have problems in this condition. So the fact that they're all kind of lined up right here, these, these um, structures, uh, says to me that that may be sort of an important general area. Um, area postrema down here is a little hole in the blood-brain barrier where things can sort of pass through relatively easily. They call it a fenestration, like a window. Uh, it's not like the blood-brain barrier is this really tight seal, um, but the fact is this is sort of an open area that's, it's sort of, part of its job is to sample the periphery a little bit. It's the reason, for example, that you feel nauseous during uh, food poisoning or when you've drank too much. This is part of what triggers the nausea. Um, and if you take a look at Barndon's paper um, from 2018, it really lines up really well. Of course, this is zoomed in, so it's really pixelated. But it lines up really well with those autonomic centers and neuroinflammatory centers in brainstem. Um, and this is actually, again, it's statistics, not necessarily biology. It's a proxy for biology. This is T1 signal, um, where they interpreted it as um, a myelination story, uh, which is plausible. That's a reasonable interpretation. My, my interpretation would be that it's maybe macromolecules, maybe it's penetration of some of the bigger molecules through that area postrema from the periphery um, that maybe normally wouldn't make it in there. We don't know, but it's um, worth thinking about. So there again is those, uh, those centers. Um, so just a little bit of review. This is the hypothesis paper that I wrote in 2013. I never argued that this was like it, that this is the answer. We found it. Um, I think it's an important mechanism that we ought to think about. Um, and, and I think it ties in a lot of proposed mechanisms. So it may be sort of a hub that we can think about. And essentially, the afferent vagus nerve, the one going body to brain, um, it has a lot of sort of different jobs. Um, it detects peripheral catecholamines. So like, just as an example of how central this is, when you have an adrenaline response right on top of your kidneys, um, it, th that doesn't actually easily make it across the blood-brain barrier. A lot of what happens is your vagus detects it and then causes an epinephrine response on the brain side of the blood-brain barrier, right? Um, so just get, give an idea of how central it is. Um, it detects local immune signaling molecules, which I think is really important. So again, that sickness response that happens when you're sick with everything, whether it's strep or the flu, despite one's a bacteria, one's a virus, you, you still kind of feel the same sickness which overlaps with this condition. Again, I'm not so sure that it is this condition, but it certainly is important, and it's important to why people feel so bad. The vagus nerve, it's, 
got the, the same root as the word vagabond, right? It wanders all over the torso. It's very highly branched and very sensitive, so it's got chemoreceptors that can pick up these little um, uh, immune responses that can happen in very local. So that's, to my mind, that's part of the reason that you don't necessarily need to see circulating peripheral cytokines in order to have a, a sickness response. So we have to be careful of type 2 error uh, in, that, uh, in that realm of study, and we talked a little bit about that in the review. Another thing that um, Vegas does, on an ongoing basis, it surveys the gut microbiome, which we've heard a lot about microbiome. This is an area that's sort of like really, you know, it's pretty clear that it's becoming more and more important. Um, so for one thing, I think it's important to note that there's bacteria and viruses in the biome, some of which we don't even know what they are yet. Those potentially pathogenic microorganisms interact with one another um, through phages sometimes. Um, they actually can produce metabolites, so a, a large chunk of the metabolites that people are measuring might not be from human sources. Um, they like to take advantage uh, in different ways of the, the body's existing system, so they like to, for example, uh, hijack mitochondrial DNA. Um, so that, that's a potential source of some of these sort of systemic problems is microbiome disruption. And also, it should be uh, clear at this point that the, the gut, of course, is not made of Tupperware. It's not sealing all these things in, and it's becoming more and more clear that there are microbiomes in other forms of tissue, including brain, uh, which is pretty interesting uh, that, you know, at least sort of later in life. So, uh, for example, Al Alzheimer's is associated with a dysbiosis uh, of the otherwise um, not harmful biome. At least we don't think it's harmful. So it's something to think about. Um, and, of course, it initiates the central illness response by sending a signal up to the brain um, from the periphery. And uh, we can measure that with a couple of imaging techniques that I'll talk about. Um, Okay, so here's the brain, and just for like a little bit of kind of review, but I hope it, ho hope it drives home some of the points. Um, so there's circulating immune cells, and these are sort of like kind of the dumb uh, innate immune cells. You know, they're not targeted specifically like an antibody. They kind of respond to, to anything abnormal. I, to my mind, importantly, not just pathogens, but also sort of... Uh, evidence of damage. So they respond to things called pathogen-associated molecular patterns, so patterns that are on different forms of pathogens, virus, bacteria, whatever, um, but also potential damage, um, so like broken up uh, pieces of neurons and things like that, um, and also possibly sort of pressure, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, there is this blood-brain barrier, which of course is not perfect. Um, so when uh, any sort of pathogen connects with the pathogen-associated molecular patterns of these innate immune cells, they activate, um, and then they, they release pro-inflammatory cytokines. Now, not all cytokines are going to just passively diffuse due to this blood-brain barrier. Cytokines are pretty big. Um, they're, lipoph they're lipophobic uh, polypeptide molecules, so they don't just easily diffuse across a lipid bilayer uh, in the, in the blood-brain barrier, right? So uh, in other words, there has to be other ways that they can get through. Now, just to be clear, the blood-brain barrier can be disrupted in aging. It can be disrupted in neurological conditions. It's probably disrupted in this condition. So this is one area where we might get sort of stuck in, in circuits a little bit. Um, but another way that these communicate is through that area postrema, through, through circumventricular organ. There's seven of these. This isn't the only one, but I'm talking about this because I think brain stem is important. Um, and what happens is they actually go right through. Um, and interestingly, um, cells can actually be actively transported across these circumventricular organs as well. So there's actually chemoattractants uh, at those sort of fenestrations that bring the cells in. And then the cells on the other side of the blood-brain barrier will de novo release um, pro-inflammatory cytokines. So a third way is through the vagus nerve. Um, again, this is all over the trunk, um, so it can happen in a very localized area, you know, what some particular area of your trunk. So again, pathogens or some damage-associated um, pattern will activate these cells. They'll release um, pro-inflammatory cytokines, and because they have sensors all over, the, all over the place, the vagus can pick up a very small amount 
um, and then sends an afferent signal up the vagus nerve that de novo creates new microglia activation on the other side of the blood-brain barrier. That includes cytokines. The triangles are supposed to represent cytokines. So in other words, it's not like cytokines get sucked up like a hose. It actually is nerve signaling that triggers it on the other side. And I think that's sort of interesting because if there's some sensitized thing happening in the periphery, you could have an ongoing um, activation being sent to the brain, um, sort of on an ongoing basis. Um, so just for like a quick uh, review there, the highly branched structure allows detection of local immune signaling. Um, local signaling does not have to be infectious, so it can be microbiome, um, you know, which sort of may or may not be infectious, I guess, depending on how you define that term. Um, but it can pick up the sort of inflammatory milieu of the, of the microbiome. Um, and it can also be damage. Um, and it triggers a mirror response of central glial activation. Um, so that's really close to what we see here, right? The activation is um, here on the brain side of the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and what I wanted to talk about is uh, microglia. So th what I showed you before included macrophages, just means big eater. It's those cells that sort of like to engulf uh, foreign stuff. And microglia have different functions depending on where they are. So there, there are things called what's, what's called a tissue resident macrophage. Um, in other words, there are different types of macrophages that go in different tissues. And they sort of um, end up there during development. The microglia are the brain's tissue resident macrophages. Interestingly, to my mind, some of the conditions that seem to be slightly comorbid, like so endometriosis, for example, there's a lot of strong arguments that that is uh, a disorder of the resident macrophages of the endometrium. So it's something to think about, that this may partially explain some of the comorbidities uh, that we see at, at maybe at a higher rate than normal. Um, so anyways, these are the resident macrophages. And again, when a pathogen or, crucially, cytokines, perhaps through diffusion, perhaps through uh, a circumventricular organ, um, connect with a macrophage. They change shape. Jared uh, showed some real, this is a cartoon. Jared showed some real pictures. Um, they change shape, though, so they withdraw in their little arms. They actually change shape, um, and they become active, and they, they have sort of a different morphology, right? Um, and then they dump out. So the, the triangles are supposed to represent cytokines. We know about that, pro-inflammatory cytokines. There's a bunch of different kinds. They interact. Uh, but also they, they release neuroexcitatory modulators. So glutamate, the classic excitatory amino acid, ATP, uh, prostaglandins, a bunch of stuff, uh, reactive oxygen species actually, um, a bunch of stuff that sort of activates neurons. Evolutionarily, it may be because it's trying to keep nearby damaged neurons alive by making them fire, making them form more connections. Uh, who knows? But that's sort of important, I think, for perhaps if this is really a, a condition marked by microglia activation, that may be part of what hurts sort of signal to noise in normal cognition, uh, especially depending on which brain regions um, uh, it's happening in. This is the, the neuroexcitation, by the way, is why you know, within five years of a bad TBI, about uh, half of um, t uh, TBI patients end up with seizures. Um, so it's something to think about. Um, and also, another thing that it produces during this process is that translocator protein, um, which is the, the target that those PET scans pick up on. Um, and so this is the thing we're actually measuring. The fact is that the, the, the function of the translocator protein is not super well understood. There's ideas. It's bound to the uh, mitochondrial membrane. This is one of those examples, by the way, where if NIH wanted to, to help the field, um, this is one thing that they could do where, with basic research. This is a thing where a scientist who's not really necessarily thinking, oh, I'm doing ME research right now, they could be tracking down what exactly does the translocator protein do. Um, and we could sort of figure out what is our pet signal telling us. Um, so I just think that's something that maybe we could um, think about. Um, and that this causes immune signaling, neuroexcitation, and the translocator protein. So I've sort of made this cartoon to symbolize the, the, that idea of microglial priming. The fact is it's not a morphological state that we understand. We can't look at, and at this point we can't even measure uh, a microglia and say, oh, it's primed. It's a functional state. So what it means is subsequent uh, 
provocations produce a bigger response, easier. Um, and that's another area where perhaps uh, NIH could fund some basic research that would really help us. What, what is microglia priming? Tell us more about that. What can we identify in a rodent model? Um, what exactly is it? Um, that's something that the microglia world is really interested in, I think. Um, and all that that means is when it's primed and some other challenge of the exact same size again hits the microglia, it's going to give you whatever, twice as big of a response. Um, and this, I think Jared sort of alluded to this, uh, I think this is part of what might be leading to increased sensitization. So that seems to be a really common theme in this condition, like sensitivity to stuff that might not normally cause such uh, sensitivity. So if you've got, for example, primed microglia dumping out excitation through the thalamus, which is what Nakatomi showed. Uh, it's what a, what a bunch of different groups showed um, with spectroscopy. Thalamus is where senses go. It's like a, a, a you know, one of those old school operators, right? Uh, it's like a relay station. And this may be where there's a lack of inhibition and you're getting sort of uh, excess painful sensory stimuli that, that can be really bothersome. So um, this is thalamus kind of right in the middle. Um, so just to revisit Nakatomi really quick, they use, as Jared said, they use this PK-11195, a first, um, a first generation radio ligand for this translocated protein. And really great, really important study. Super glad they did it. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's a really important study. And also at the same time, I'm not sure that it quite means what a lot of patients think it means because the fact is that microglia are activated in a lot of stuff. Um, and that's part of why we have to really have good methods to see uh, is it different than in all these other conditions. So here it is. This is the exact same radio ligand that Nakatomi used uh, after traumatic brain injury. Um, here it is after stroke. Here it is in complex regional pain syndrome. Here it is in Huntington's disease. Um, now it's Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's, autism, depression associated with age, depression associated with, with suicidality. Um, here's bipolar, uh, and here's recent onset schizophrenia, right? So when you see a study that shows you you've got PK11195 binding or microglia activation, and we go, ah, yes, neuroinflammation, that this is a myalgic encephalomyelitis, we have neuroinflammation. Yeah, that's true, and so does like almost everything else, neurological or even psychiatric. So I think it's super important that we get really detailed methods to tell us how this is different, if it is, than all these other conditions. Uh, is it different qualitatively, quantitatively, location, um, what? So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so essentially these studies, you inject this radio ligand, and all that means is you've got something that binds to this protein and you make it a little bit radioactive uh, with sort of slow decay. Um, and the signal is normalized to arterial blood um, or to a reference brain region, which is uh, the reference brain region is what Nakatomi did, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, patients are compared to controls. So here's um, an example where in an fMRI here on the left, and this is sort of raw PET data, or, well not raw, it's transformed, but uh, it's the transformed PET data here that's showing uh, uptake. In this case, this is just an FDG study that we did as sort of a pilot. Um, we had some access to free scan time at our center. And what you normally do is sort of register, and then for everybody, you compare either the whole brain or specific regions of interest to a control region, and it's usually cerebellum. That's a perfectly legitimate and normal thing for research groups to do. It's what Nakatomi did. But I would argue that it may be not be such a good idea in a condition that we're still trying to kind of characterize. The cerebellum is filled with really large blood vessels. So it could be the case, for example, that there's immune cells circulating through those big blood vessels. Um, it could be the case when you're comparing, um, you know, we know that at least a recent study showed that HHV6 in the cerebellum uh, is more active than in, patient, than in controls. So there, you know, I don't know if that's a specific cerebellum story, but um, it could be. Um, and also there's a couple other reasons that perhaps doing this sort of comparison may not work so well. Um, and so here's some confounds and alternate interpretations. So control groups, obviously, when you're just comparing to healthy controls, 
and I hope everybody in this field is always thinking about just sedentary. That matters, of course, right? Um, there, is some uh, there is some evidence that fitness is, is inversely associated with these microglia activation uh, states. So that's just an important thing. We make sure we're not just looking at people that are housebound or, or um, you know, have to exercise less. Um, the, the use of second generation radio ligands. One of the things I really appreciated is that Jared, uh, me, and the Montoya group are all going to use different ones. And normally I understand that that might sound like it's bad news. But I think it's good news with these different radio ligands because one of the things that's cool about neuroimaging is you can really compare uh, across groups and see if we're seeing the same pattern. So I, I look forward to doing that. Um, if this really is a condition marked by problems with blood-brain barrier permeability, which there's some evidence for, the fact that Nakatomi saw more signal could just mean more is making it across the blood-brain barrier. So that's why we think it's important to do an arterial line where you sample artery blood so you really know how much is actually making it into the brain on an ongoing basis. Um, and what's cool about it is if we do this arterial line, we'll be able to take the data from uh, the other groups and sort of verify that their modeling uh, is, is valid, which I suspect it will be, but we have to sort of preemptively prepare for critics um, and sort of undermine their arguments, I think, ahead of time. Um, so general metabolism, we've heard over and over again, maybe it's the case that patients aren't breaking down the radio ligand and therefore more is making it into the brain. So you need to sort of think about that, and that's part of why uh, an arterial line would really be a good idea. Um, and I talked about reference regions. Uh, arterial, using an arterial line really is the gold standard. It's going to be really difficult and expensive, um, but I think we, we hope it's going to be worth it. Um, okay. So I'll talk just for a quick moment about efferent vagus nerve function. Um, so that's the sort of motor vagus. Part of what happens um, is that there's an anti-inflammatory reflex that ought to turn on when you get an inflammatory signal heading towards the brain, the efferent vagus ought to be making a synapse here at spleen, uh, which is a beta adrenergic synapse, by the way. Um, so I guess I'd be curious what people think about pro how propranolol might affect that. Um, but it, synapse is in the spleen, and that produces IL-10, anti-inflammatory. And the fact that people are having all these autonomic problems, to my mind, is evidence that this system is really not working very well. Um, there's parasympathetic autonomic control. We know that patients don't do well on the tilt table test. Uh, they often have POTS, uh, auto, uh, this sort of uh, autonomic incompetence that we can measure with ICPET and uh, just normal exercise tests. And we think that brainstem is really important. And I want to talk a little bit about, I'm trying to make a pitch for why this method is important. So normally when you're doing registration in a brain study, you take a bunch of your patients and you kind of have to co combine them to be able to compare across brains. So what you do is you literally spatially register all of them, and then you compare across, um, then you compare across um, brains. So the problem is not all brains are the same, of course. Um, so you may not end up in a situation in which you've got a brain that you have to sort of register, um, change shape. Um, and this is actually the way that these imaging techniques work. But the problem is, do I have to stop? Okay, I'm sorry, I'm going over. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh. you. Well, yeah. I'm sorry I'm going over. I, I free associate a little too much. Well, by popular demand. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, everybody. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I appreciate the applause that undermines my anxiety. Thank you. Um, so, essentially, um, you normally sort of spatially register, but the problem is it's done with neocortex. This is the standard technique. It's what almost every brain imaging study you've ever read does. And you have to, if you're interested in brainstem, you have to do it specifically. Um, so let's just make an example where, um, let's just say in some theoretical condition, the entire brainstem is active. So that's the actual answer. Brainstem is entirely active, right? So when you do spatial registration, it lines up with neocortex, but, and what happens is, your program will say, where is all the activation happening? And it'll see where they overlap, all of them together. And it'll tell you there's the answer, right? The fact is that we know that it was the whole brain stem. I'm not saying that's what's happening in MECFS. I'm just giving an example, right? So this may be part of why the Nakatomi paper 
uh, sort of missed that dorsal area that uh, the Barnston paper did. And literally, uh, Vitaly Napado did this and demonstrated over here, we published this figure in our paper, demonstrated that literally with normal registration, this is 10 brains, each of these is 10 brains. You can see the neocortex looks fine, but the brainstem does not. Um, and I wanted to show this slide um, just to demonstrate that this is what's happening with heartbeats in your brain. This is an NIH-funded study. It was on the director's blog. Um, and literally, it moves uh, all the time with heartbeats. Um, and this is part of what circulates cerebral spinal fluid. This is really important for actual blood perfusion um, of the brain. The actual physical pumping is important. Um, interestingly, this is different in Chiari malformation, um, which I think is one of those conditions that uh, sort of, you know, overlap with this one. Um, let me just blow through this a little bit. Um, so, you know, we're doing this exercise study test with Systrom. We're scanning before and after. I'm going to show some super um, preliminary data. This is Phoebe Chan. She's measuring with an ultrasound the middle cerebral artery, what is actually happening in the brain so we can directly measure. And then we're looking at correlates so we can take into account the movement of the brain stem. Um, so as some, just some preliminary data, we found these perivascular spaces in our subjects. Um, this, you know, I have to dig into this a little bit more. I'd love to find the old scans that have, this has been reported for a while. These like hyper intensities, I don't know if this is the same thing, but this is sort of a proxy for inflammation, so I'd love to see those old scans. We got a bunch, this is like a 30 year old woman, uh, and it shouldn't look like this. Um, we've got a couple of them, and then I guess uh, my favorite is this here uh, before the exercise test, baseline symptoms versus after. So this is PEM, and we're showing uh, a pretty strong reduction in the correlation between peripheral uh, physiology and perfusion. So we think of this as a, um, a measure of cerebral vascular reactivity. So it seems like blood is literally not flowing as well. During a symptomatic state, they're doing the exact same thing in both of those uh, scans, and it's literally just their symptomatic state. And uh, I'll just stop there. Thank you.